in their Bible. But Lord, they need community. And Lord, I pray that you would bring them to us and to other Bible preaching churches, um, that they may experience the richness of what it means to follow Christ with other brothers and sisters in, in Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Romans 15, verses 1 through 7 is where we are this morning as we continue to work our way through the book of Romans. Did you guys hear about the two guys on a bridge? Uh, Mike is one guy's name and Jay is the other. Mike is about ready to jump. Jay walks up on his friend or his new acquaintance really and says, don't do it. Mike responds, nobody loves me. And Jay responds, well, God loves you. Do you believe in God? To which Mike responds, well, yes. Jay's response is, are you a Christian? Mike says, yes. Jay goes, me too. What denomination? Uh, Baptist. Oh, me too. Uh, 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 are you a Northern Baptist or a Southern Baptist? Mike responds, Northern Baptist. <laughs> me too. Are, are Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? Northern Conservative Baptist. <gasps> me too. Uh, Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region, or Northern Conservative Baptist, Eastern Region. Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region. Uh, me too. Nor Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region, Council of 1879, or Northern Great Lakes Re Region, Council of 1912. Mike responds, Northern, Cons Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region, Council of 1912, to which Jay responds, die, heretic, and he pushes him off the bridge. <laughs> Far too often, right, this is the approach amongst Christians in local churches, right? We agree on 90%. And we become fixated on the 10% of differences, or sometimes even less than that. And more often than not, the differences aren't substantive. They, they really are applicational differences where we're all holding the same biblical principle. And Romans 14 and 15 are trying to caution us to say this, that you may have applications on biblical conscience or biblical principles because of conscience, because of how you were raised, because of the experiences that you walked through in life. And we want to avoid raising our applications to the same level as doctrine itself or Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912 or whatever it may be. It, Romans 14 and 15 is creating for us a category for us to think that, that in the same church, you can have unity without unanimity. You can have, you could actually have unity without uniformity on every secondary matter. And brothers and sisters, that's not a sign of weakness. That actually can be a sign of great health in the church. I want to show you uh, two charts that are picture and then a chart that we showed you, I think, the very first Sunday, uh, four, three weeks ago. The green triangle represents God's standard. Now, again, when we're in Romans 14 and 15, let's, let's remind ourselves what we're talking about. We're not talking about core doctrines here. We're talking, or we're not even talking about areas where the Bible speaks uh, explicitly that, that that's not necessarily a core doctrine of salvation, right? Um, we're, we're talking about what the Bible refers to as conscience issues, so if, so if you say, well, you know, Jesus might be the Son of God, is the Son of God, tomato, tomato, we're, that's not what we're talking about here, okay? We're, we're talking about ch what the Bible refers to in Romans 14.1 as opinions, or what we would refer to as conscience issues. And what we find is this, is that no Christian has the exact same conscience. You may have been raised in a Christian home, under the same type of Christian teaching and preaching as, as, as a sibling of yours, and what you find is that you actually don't have exact consciences, right, that they're, that they're slightly adjusted differently. Why is that? Part of it is just, part of it is how God, is, it's the makeup of how God made us. And what we've learned in Romans 14 and 15 is this, is that they're not all going to perfectly align with exactly God's standard. That's, that's one. 
Here's the second chart. And if you don't have this chart, it was in the bulletin from the month of March, and you can find it out in the lobby. What we're shooting for is this. Uh, we're shooting for the three center columns, that of uh, either a strong conscience there towards the center left, strong conscience directly in the middle, or a weak conscience center right. What we're, what we're attempting to avoid is the far right of that of a weak conscience, which, which sounds like this. You must follow the Old Testament dietary restrictions if you want to be a Christian. That's, that's heresy. Uh, we, we don't, and some would be like, well, Pastor Joel, I would never say that. But then also we want to avoid the, the second column to the right, which is it's sinful to eat meat, and Christians who do so are being unfaithful to God. That looks like judgmentalism. But at the same time, we have, to, we have to recognize that there are, if we can put it this way, slippery slopes on both sides, right? So you can't just say, well, I'm going to be safe. Well, no, no, there's, there's, also, there's also another side to consider. We want to avoid heresy, which is the far left under strong conscience, which says from 1 Corinthians 10, I have the freedom not only to eat meat, but to go to parties at idol temples, right? Paul would say no. And we want to avoid arrogance, which is the second to the left column, which says I have the freedom to eat meat, offered idols, and those who don't are being unreasonable and, you know, are just, are in theological error. error. That's, that's arrogance. Where we, where we want to find ourselves is somewhere in those center three columns. Ultimately, where we'd like to all grow to is to the point where we're in the center column, strong conscience, where we have the, the ability to go either way out of love. But if we can at least push ourselves as a Christian church toward those three center columns, that's where, that's what we're talking about. And so I have titled our, that fourth message uh, in this mini-series through the book of Romans, When Christians Disagree, Part 4. And the very first principle that I want you to see, it's going to be found in verse 1, is this, is that the strong in faith honor God by serving the weak in faith. Uh, the, the strong in faith honor God by serving the weak in faith. Look at Romans 15, <clears throat> verse 1. We who are strong in faith, have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak in faith and not to please ourselves. That, that is, those with strong consciences, right? There are three issues going on here at which the, the Christians at the Church of Rome were disagreeing. There were, there were some who were eating meat, potentially it, uh, offered, offered to idols, unsure, right? It, it was being sold in the meat market, so that's, that's one. And there were primarily probably Jewish believers saying, no, 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 don't eat that meat, you don't know where it's been. There were others, again, uh, strong conscience Christians who were drinking the wine, and the, the point there was not drunkenness. The point, again, once again, was, was that wine potentially used in a worship service of some kind? And there were, again, likely Jewish believers saying, no, 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 don't drink that wine, Gentile believers. And then there was the fact of Jewish Christians who were observing holy days, or specifically Jewish holidays, holy days, and they were requiring or insisting that Gentile believers do the same thing. And Romans 14 and 15 says, wait a second, these are matters of conscience before the Lord. And so the very first principle is this, that the strong in faith honor God by serving those who are weak in faith. That is, those with, we could put it this way, those with strong consciences have a solemn responsibility, and here is your solemn responsibility. It is this, that we have an obligation, verse 1, to bear with the failings of the weak. That the way of, the way of love is to listen, to observe, and to adjust our life accordingly. Well, to adjust our lives for the sake of a brother or sister in Christ? Well, that's like, that's like telling a flower to bloom in, this, in the morning sun. Well, of course a flower is going to bloom. For the Christian, this is what it means to follow Christ. That right, that our, our lives are not our own. You want me to adjust for the, for the sake of another brother or sister? Of course I would, I would do something like that. So, so one more expression of what it means to follow Jesus is to consider weaker brothers and sisters in Christ so that they don't fall into sin. Look at verse 1 again. Do you see the word failings? That we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak? The word failings is the word burdens. 
Paul wants the strong in faith to see that their brothers and sisters who have come out of, of whatever they've been saved from, that they carry unique burdens. And because of those unique burdens, that those who are strong in the faith have, the ability, have been equipped to help carry those burdens. That, the, that they don't have to carry those burdens, that the weak in faith don't have to, ought not have to carry those burdens alone. That as a body of believers, that we would care enough for one another that we would carry those burdens together. Now, l- let me remind us, the weak are not simply people who disagree. That, that is a key point when it comes to Romans 14 and 15. The weak are specifically those who are led to sin, right, because of the strong's freedom in whatever area it may be. And so if you are strong, you're to carry the burdens of the weak. And by doing so, what does he say? We do not please our Uh, Here, Paul is clearly identifying himself as, what category would Paul uh, see himself in? He'd be the strong, right? We who are strong. He's not talked like this prior to Romans 15 verse 1. Before, it's just simply been the strong and the weak. And now, this time, he uses third person plural, we. Paul clearly sees himself in the strong category. Strong in faith Christians, then, we are not to be selfish and to pursue our own desires, but rather to pursue that which is going to strengthen everybody, specifically the weak in faith. Now, lest you think that the strong in faith are to submit to every mental reservation another believer has, I want you to think again, because that's not where Paul's going. Look at verse 2, Romans 15. How does Paul continue Romans 15 verse 2? Let each of us, let each, strong and the the weak, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. So here then is the second principle, that is that the strong and the weak please God by building one another up. Verse 1 primarily is addressing the strong. And here in verse 2, Paul's addressing both. He's, he's kind of grabbing both of them by the collar and saying, hey, listen, you're supposed to serve one another. One theologian writes it this way. This does not mean that the weak control the church, that they have only to express a scruple about anything and all rush to conform. That would mean that the church would be permanently tied to the weak. Paul is not laying down a, a rule of conduct. He is enunciating a principle of tender concern for the body. That is, we do not see ourselves in a, in a kind of a mirror of individualism. That all this is about just simply me and my desires. But rather we look through a lens of mutual building up. That is, if you identify as strong in faith... Do you see how a person who is weak in faith could build you up? Or are you too busy looking down on them? If you identify as weak in faith, do you see how a strong Christian could actually build you up? Or are you too busy judging them? Because that's exactly where Paul is going at in Romans 14 in the very first 10 verses or so, right? That those who are strong in the faith, what are they to avoid? They're, they're, They're to avoid looking down. And those who are weak in the faith are to avoid judging. And folks, this is where humility and mutual discipleship in the Christian church come together where we actually need both and. Part of your maturing process is to be around Christians who actually think and live differently than you. I know that's hard to believe. But this is actually one reason why you ought to be a member of a Christian church. And it's why you ought to be a member of a local church, right? One of the greatest ways for you to cultivate humility is to be in a life group with someone who thinks differently about a a topic that you actually hold kind of near and dear. 
It's actually intended for your maturity to be up around someone who thinks differently. He either has a, he has a stricter conscience or a more free conscience to participate or to do things. That's part of what God's intention is for you to grow as a follower of Jesus. It's part of the humility and the love that we're supposed to be known for. And one of the greatest ways to cultivate that is to be sitting in a life group, not to, have, not to have a life group of just strong in faith people and a life group of just weak in faith people or to have services uh, of, of different types where weak in faith uh, uh, worship in one and strong in faith worship in another. No, that God actually has intended. So when we talk about, we talk a lot about multis around here, multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-generational, that it actually is part of God's process that there be a multi-conscience worshiping together, and that we serve one another. Here's the third principle found in verse 3. For Christ, so why are we to please our, our neighbor, to build him up? For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Here's the third principle. That is, the strong and the weak Follow Christ by encouraging one another. You say, why, if, first, if the second principle is the strong and the weak please God by building up one another, and then the third principle is the strong and the weak follow Christ by encouraging one another, what, what really is the difference? That I don't know that there's much difference except for that Paul takes the time to actually unpack it in greater detail. Now, at first reading, we, at first reading, do you got this, right, when Dorothy read this to us? At first reading, we get the connection that Christ did not please himself, therefore we should not please ourselves. Everyone got that? Like, that's a pretty, that's a pretty easy connection to get. But why the quotation from Psalms? Did you see that? Why that quotation, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me? So let's do this. You're in Romans 15. Let's turn back to Psalm 69. I want, to sh I want you to see this connection, try and I'll try to make the, the, the link. Psalm 69 is where Paul is quoting from. Now I'm going to begin reading in verse 7. So Psalm 69, verse 7, and then we'll flip right back to Romans 15. Here we are. Psalm 69, verse 7. David is actually the one writing here, right? And he says, it is for your sake, David writes, that I have borne reproach, we could say parenthetically as the king of Israel, that dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's son. Well, why, David? Well, here's why. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me, David writes to our Lord. Jesus picks up that phrase from Psalm 69 and he quotes it of himself using it of his ministry. What was Jesus, what, Jesus was known for an extraordinary zeal for what? His father's house, right? That is, he actually uses language like this. And is this fascinating to you? He actually says that his meat and his drink was to do what pleased the Father. Paul, here in Romans 15, directs the Roman believers and our attention to the example of our Lord. He wants to encourage us, we are to encourage one another two ways. Number one, to follow the example of our Lord by not seeking our will and to make the Father's will our meat and drink. That zeal for the Lord's house is, is what consumes us. That's one way. By not seeking your own will, here's the other way. Look at verse 4, Romans 15. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Whatever was written in former days, what's that? Well, he finishes off the sentence to say, it's the scriptures. You and I would refer to it as the, the Bible or the... Old Testament, right? That is, whatever was written in former days. So this, this Old Testament, here's, where, here's the second piece where we're to encourage one another. Paul is endeavoring to push 
Paul does not divide. Paul does not separate them. Paul is endeavoring to push the strong and the weak together to the same source for mutual encouragement, the Scriptures. He is primarily speaking of of what you and I would refer to as the Old Testament. That is, God intends for the strong, God intends for the strong and the weak to know each other, to know each other's burdens so well that we can use the Scripture to provide encouragement and endurance for one another. So God actually wants you to be friends with people who think differently than you do. I know that's a shocker. But again, we're talking about Romans 14 and 15 issues here. That is, we're to know each other so well that we're using scriptures to provide endurance and encouragement. That, that in the Christian church, there are, no, there are no holy huddles, right? Us four and no more. That we are a community covenanted together in membership where God's word is intended to reverberate among us the strong and the weak. And we are to be encouraging and building up one another. This, this is why he says the strong and the weak, we follow Christ as we encourage one another. It's the third principle. Let me give you the, the fourth principle in just a moment. It's in verse 5, we see this kind of mini benediction, if you will. Uh, Romans 15, verse 5, reads this way. Now, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I can hear that benediction being read by one of our brothers here at Grace Life. Can you not? I can hear it. And when Paul writes those verses in verses 5 and 6, it sounds like a divine oath of the triune God doing what? Defeating self-righteous snobbery. It is a, a promise of divine deliverance from divisiveness. It is a prayer from the from the pen of Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It is a prayer of a sovereign undertaking, guaranteeing victory in Christ's church over our carnality. That is, the God who gives salvation is the same one who speaks through his word and gives endurance and encouragement to the weak and to the strong. Now, did you notice the five expressions of unity in verses Five and six. I circled them. You might want to as well. I, I circled harmony. I circled one another. Accord. Verse six. Together. One voice. I mean, if you want a sixth one, you could, verse seven, one another. Those six expressions of unity, why would Paul spend over 10% of a book given to the doctrine of salvation on differences of opinion over matters of conscience? Why would he do that? Do you want to know the, the, the so what? Like, what? why Paul? Why do all this? Look at verse 7. Therefore, because of everything, Romans 14, 1 through Romans 15, verse 6. Therefore... Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Why? For the glory of God. That's why you welcome one another. Why should you welcome and not simply tolerate? Why should you welcome and not quarrel? Romans 14 1. Why should you welcome and not divide? Why should you welcome and not simply put up with? You should welcome to worship. Why? What? Folks, I I think I need to get this through. Why do you need to welcome and worship people who think differently about Halloween? 
Why do you need to welcome and worship with people who think differently about alcohol? Why do you need to do, I'm just, I'm trying to choose as many hot buttons as I can right now to, to kind of get it. The, the reason why is this, because look how verse 7 ends. You are to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for this reason, for the glory of God. This is, this really is a glory of God issue. And I'm talking on both sides of that, by the way. I'm not just talking on one side or the other, the other side. And the reason why is because that's how Paul is going to speak about these issues. Because this really is a glory of God issue. Now, I want you to do this. I'm in Romans 15. Would you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, and then we'll go to another passage before we eventually come back to Romans 15. So Hebrews chapter 2. And, and there's, by the way, there's way more applications to be made than just what I, those two that I just gave, but we've, we've gone through the gamut of those. So I need not repeat them all. I want to show you a verse that God has used like a spiritual axe to my self-righteousness. This verse has been God's gracious reminder to me to break me over and over again of my self-righteousness. And may God do so to you as well. And at the same time, to break me of my self-righteousness, God has also used this verse to put steel in my backbone when some would want grace life to be narrower than the scriptures themselves. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm just going to pick up one verse out of the middle of the, con and you can read the context later. Verse, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11 reads this way. For he who sanctifies and those who, sanct who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. I remember coming across this, this verse specifically in a Bible reading, and it dawned on me that my self-righteousness toward other brothers and sisters was a shame to my God. Because if Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers, then neither should I. And neither should you. There is, a, there is intended for there to be mutual humility and mutual love toward brothers and sisters on charity issues. I don't know if you've heard of the name of A.W. Tozer. Tozer was a preacher from a generation plus ago now. He said, he used this illustration often about the unity of the church. He said, it's impossible to, to get 400 pianos tuned exactly to each other just using a piano. That's impossible to do. But if an individual had one tuning fork, you could get 400 pianos tuned exactly to the same tuning fork. Brothers and sisters, so it is with us. That if all we do is hold up the tuning fork of whatever issue it is and try to get everybody to come to agreement on this, whatever it may be, that's not the scriptural position. The scriptural position is to have the tuning fork of Jesus Christ played over and over and over again, allowing time and room for us all to grow at our own pace and tuning ourselves the Lord Jesus Christ. And in recognizing diversity of opinions, Romans 14 and 15, we do say this, right? Diversity must never be the end in and of itself. Diversity, whether it's generational or ethnic or lingual or diversity of opinions, is only beautiful when we are united and tuned to Jesus. Other than that, 
It's just diversity in the Christian church. But diversity in the Christian church is not like diversity in the world. We long for a unity around Christ that is centered on the Lord Jesus himself. Someday, I hope it's a long time from now, I'll be dead and gone. (laughs) But whoever stands in this pulpit, it is your responsibility to make sure that he proclaims Jesus over and over and over and over again. And it is quite frankly your responsibility to make sure that Joel preaches Jesus over and over and over and over again. Grace Life, I say this to you, this call for Christian unity, this is not some, this is not some 21st century Western philosophy. That's not what this is. If that's what you think it is, throw that out the window because we're calling for something much deeper than that. So I want to show you where this actually comes from, not only from Romans 14 and 15, but I want you to turn all the way back to John chapter 17, known as our Lord's high priestly prayer. And I want to show you the final ending of our Lord's prayer as he prayed. John 17, verse 20, and then we'll hit Romans 15 one more time. John chapter 17, our Lord's high priestly prayer, we would say this, right? All final words are important words. Whatever somebody says right before they pass are very important. Our Lord is about ready to pass. And in John 17, our Lord prays for the unity of his body then and now. Look at John 17, verse 20. He says this, I do not ask for these only. Who's the these? It's his disciples. We can maybe say the apostles later on. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me. That's you and I, right? Those who will believe in me through their word. That is the apostles' word. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be one, just as you, Father, are in me. And I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given given me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. Verse 23, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Do you see that our unity in Jesus Christ is actually part of God's evangelism program? Like we're going to do a pizza and prayer walk? That's not evangelism. Giving the gospel while we do that, that would be evangelism. But part of the evangelistic program of a Christian church is that we actually are unified around the gospel of Jesus Christ. And disunity undermines that gospel. And I would say this, that the unity that our Lord prays for is not a unity on secondary matters. Otherwise, Paul would, have, Paul would not have taught us Romans 14 and 15. Our unity is a oneness of purpose, a oneness of mission, and it is centered around the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our diversity... Again, not just generational or ethnic or lingual, but our diversity of opinions on these matters actually accentuates the mission as we reach people with the gospel in our spheres of influence. Now, back to Romans 15, and we'll conclude with verse 7. Romans chapter 15, verse 7, one more time, reads this way, Therefore... Welcome one another. But it's a very specific type of welcoming. As Christ welcomed you for the glory of God. This is not a salesman at your door that you open the door and go, hey, how are you? And you're thinking of a bajillion ways of how you can close the door without being rude. That's not the type of welcoming. It is a welcoming like Christ welcomes. How does Christ welcome? How did Christ welcome you? 
Can, let me just do that. Let, for the next few moments, I've got, I think, five quick illustrations. How did Christ welcome the man with leprosy? In the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, leprosy is often a picture of sin. Lepers were literally placed outside the Israelite encampment. But when we read the story of the man who was healed of his leprosy, do you know what we should walk away with? I am the man with leprosy. And with a word, Jesus makes me whole. When we read of that demon-possessed man, the demoniac of Gadara, he's got cuts and bruises and scars as he has so defaced his body because of the demon possession. He's enslaved by sin. We should say this, I am the demon possessed man, enslaved by my sins. Some hideous to our culture, most very culturally acceptable, but with a word, Jesus cleanses the demoniac and he cleanses me. We are the, the deaf whom Jesus causes to hear and we are the blind whom Jesus causes to see. And spiritually speaking, our Savior gave us the ability to hear his voice, to see his salvation in Christ we are the woman with the issue of blood, this lifelong uh, sickness that prevented her from participating in the worship, in the temple worship. She was unclean, and yet she touched the hem of his garment and was made clean. So too, in our uncleanness, we too, by faith, reached out and have been made clean on the inside by Jesus. This, folks, we, you remember the, de the demon-possessed boy who often threw himself into the fire? And Jesus had to come and say to the demon, be gone? Or do you remember the, the little girl, Jairus' daughter, who laid dead in her parents' home? In both cases, our Savior showed kindness and compassion to us that though sin ravages us externally, like throwing that, that little boy and thrown into the fire, or internally as the body stopped working altogether, that with a word, Jesus removes demons and gives life. And if God welcomes them, and if the blood of Christ is sufficient to cover their sins, then so it is sufficient for us to welcome and to receive one another on much lesser issues than these issues that Jesus healed. That is, if Christ did not serve himself but us, then so we ought to serve our brothers and sisters as well. And if Christ receives those with strict consciences and those with freedom of conscience, then surely we can too as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Christ has welcomed us. Lord, as I finish that last portion of that sermon, would there be a tinge of kind of guilt by some who have not yet received Jesus? That they really don't see themselves as blind or deaf. They don't really see themselves as dead in their trespasses and sins. They just kind of take a different viewpoint, a different understanding. That's all. A slightly a different take on Jesus than, than maybe we would hear or than the Bible would. Oh, Lord, may they see that they are bound in their chain and their sins. That unless Jesus speaks, they will go to a Christless eternity in that place called hell. Lord, we beg and implore your spirit to give understanding and to give conviction. And by faith, Lord, I thank you even now that you are drawing men and women because the gospel has been preached to yourself. Now, Lord, I pray 
that we here at Grace Life, when we're coming to Romans 14 and 15 type issues, you would give us a strictness with ourselves and a generosity towards others. Forgive us when we are generous with ourselves and strict toward others. Lord, we preach these things not to reflect a a culture that seems to tolerate anything and everything. But we preach these things, number one, because your word has said it. And we want you to receive the glory that is due your name. This is our intent and purpose. And by your spirit, may each of your children here receive this word it's from yourself for it is your word to this church this day and we pray this in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ